It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. O'Malley joins Serenity Caldwell and the great John Graham coming uh, to talk about the Time Warner Cable Comcast merger. Looks like it may actually go through. Is Google really evil? Our panel says absolutely. And uh, we'll talk about the latest from Script Kitties. It's going to turn out they've got some real good new tools at their disposal. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 445, recorded February 16th, 2014. Shave my dog. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Hover.com. Hover is the best way to buy and manage domain names. It's simple, honest, and easy to use. For 10% off your first purchase, visit Hover.com slash Twit2 and use the offer code Twit2. And by Audible.com. Sign up for the Platinum Plan and get two free books. Visit audible.com slash twit2. And don't forget to follow Audible on Twitter. User ID audible underscore com. And by FreshBooks, the simple cloud accounting solution that helps thousands of entrepreneurs and small business owners save time billing and get paid faster. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com and join over 5 million users running their businesses with ease. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, visit squarespace.com and use the offer code TWIT2. It's time for TWIT This Week in Tech, the show where we cover all the week's tech news. And we have so much fun doing it, and I want to welcome our panel, a great panel. Kind of uh, some people we haven't had on in a while. Of course, Serenity Caldwell, we love. Uh, all the way from Boston, where it's snowing. It is, Mac or full of snow. Not yep. so much snowing anymore. But Macworld.com. She's also on the Incomparable podcast. I listened to that Christmas one after you were here last time. What did you think? Wow. Glenn Fleischman does some really good voices. Yes, he does. <laughs> and Andy Anatko. Anatko. Andy I knew Andy me. did. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what fun that was. You did a, a play, a Doctor Who Yes, and a it was, Doctor Who spinoff, yeah, pseudo homage. Really fun. Anyway, great to have you back. Great to be here. And uh, since you're stuck inside anyway, might as well. Also with us from Giga Ohm, the legendary Ohm Malik, the Yoda of tech journalists. Really? That's what you're going to call me now? <laughs> you called me that once, and I figured turnabout is fair play. <laughs> Making me feel really old. <laughs> no, no, old, Yoda's not old. He's super smart. And he speaks backwards. The only person who accuses me of that is my mother, and you're the second person. <laughs> anyway, it's really nice to see you again. Haven't had you on in ages, and it's a sh it's a shame. So we're glad to have you back. Uh, we do have many Giga Omers on all the time, including uh, Matthew Ingram. We love. Uh, so great to have you back. Thanks for joining us, Om. Thank poor, you, Lee. poor Om will be compelled to hold his microphone for the entire show because we neglected to give him a stand he could use. <laughs> But you sound marvelous. I know. That's Rich, fine. beautiful. Yeah. I feel like a broadcast journalist. Yeah. Right. You're doing a stand-up in your apartment. Yes. I'm standing here in my apartment. You may wonder why. Also joining us from Great Britain, where are you, uh, John? Uh, I'm in a basement somewhere in London. <laughs> joining us from a London basement, uh, John Graham Cunham, Cunning, uh, Cumming, who is a computer programmer. In fact, I first met him. Uh, due to his anti-spam uh, open source program, Pop File, which I use and loved. Uh, he also wrote a, we had him back when he wrote the uh, Geek uh, Atlas, which is a travel book for geeks so with all the great places you should go. You may remember when he did uh, the petition to, uh, to apologize to Alan Turing. Uh, the British government did, in fact, apologize thanks to that yep. petition. That's great. Yep, they did. And you've been building, and I think we contributed to this, uh, Charles Babbage's uh, analytical engine. Is that is that going on now? Are you building it now? Uh, we're not actually building it. We're trying to figure out uh, what he was actually going to build, given that he left tens of thousands of handwritten notes behind about it. So there's, <laughs> you know, it's a little archaeology project. He was crazy. 
And no, <laughs> is it going to crazy? <laughs> is it is it steam powered? Uh, I think it will have to be steam powered just because the amount of metal you got to move around. Holy a small cow. steam engine. A small steam engine, a few thousand gears, and a dream. Yep. Plan28.org if you want to read about it. That's the one. Yeah. Do you have enough money to do it? Uh, we have enough money for the moment. Um, uh, when we come to build it, I suspect we're going to need quite a lot more money just because of the amount of uh, brass we're going to need. But for the moment, it's research projects, and we managed to get a very large grant to do that. So that's happening. Wow. It's made out of brass. Uh, it's made out of gunmetal, which is uh, an amalgam of a couple of different things. Uh, and a lot of iron as well, of course. And it's probably horrifically noisy when it's running, right? <laughs> well, we don't know. That's a good question. Um, that, Babbage was actually quite good about trying to keep things quiet. So we'll see. But it's big. I can't wait. What a great idea. Anyway, great to have you all here. This uh, had a lot of news this week. And I, you know, I don't know exactly what the big story is. I have to think... It's the bid by Comcast to buy Time Warner Cable, um, which strikes me as perhaps a tempest in the teapot since there's no way the Department of Justice, the Federal Trade Commission, or the FCC will approve this, or is there, Ohm? I, I have a sneaking suspicion that this will get approved because I think all the processes, uh, the anti-monopoly processes we have, have been broken in this country, and they have been. For a while, I think the excuse Comcast is going to make is that since there is no overlap in the territories, it's not really uh, a monopoly. And but it, it doesn't make any sense for for the government to approve this, but it will get an, approved, unfortunately. Is, does that serenity carry weight, the fact that they're not in the same market? So if my Internet service provider or cable company is Comcast... It's not going to change. If it's Time Warner, it's not going to change. That just the merged company will have more customers. They're growing larger. We've seen this in mergers in the past. I'm not an expert on um, on monopoly law, but uh, I'm not like um, I'm not terribly shocked if this is like I don't necessarily want it to pass, but I am not. I won't be shocked if they agree. Um, so they have, the uh, Department of Justice agrees to kind of let this come together. The markets is a good loophole. And in addition, there's so much Comcast uh, lobbying money in Washington right now uh, for a variety of things, net neutrality among them, that I'm, I, I'm not going to be shocked if they, if they don't, you know, they don't say the, too much about it. The reason I would be, you know, worried about this is not just that they're going to be in the same, not in the same markets, but these guys will have a massive influence on how you and I access content on the internet. So if they have such a massive, you know, control over the, the consumer market, they can actually control the pricing, you know, the per gigabyte ban bandwidth pricing can come into play. They can... Uh, do things like charge, you know, companies more money to send traffic on their network. And I think that's the big challenge right now is if you, uh, any future Instagram or any future Netflix has very little, you know, recourse once you have these mega, uh, you know, you know, giants uh, you know, controlling the internet access. And I think that is the thing we should all be worried about. Not that they are not in the same markets. The the challenge we have is that the FCC chairman is uh, is you know who's his he he's has a cable a guy. Yeah. So <laughs> good luck trying to get anything past him. Or you look at you know some of the other uh, you know legislative uh, bodies. They're like pretty highly compromised, and the lobbying machines of you know cable companies and and telcos is pretty amazingly strong and I think people here in the valley don't quite understand or don't really pay that much attention to the politics of networks like they are all so obsessed with the here and now of lining their pockets that they don't really realize that these are the guys who are the really the enemy of innovation in America is the the big giant cable and telephony monopolies and I think I am increasingly worried about what's going to happen in the future. 
it's not it's it's both cable television and internet and it's bad in both businesses comcast is the number one cable company 23 million subs uh time warner cable number two with 12 that makes them 35 million subscribers they're the number comcast is the number one isp time warner is the number three isp that would give them uh a total of 31 million households and I think it's been pretty clear. I don't know about Time Warner, but it's been pretty clear that Comcast doesn't care a whit for net neutrality. And having this kind of clout with content creators will put a terrible uh, burden on content creators. I, you know, I think there's pretty good evidence, even though it's illegal, that Comcast, for instance, is slowing down Netflix right now. Um, a really yeah. good... Say again? Sorry. There's um no sorry it's there's an interesting thing um, that Recode was reporting in that Comcast supposedly has a written or a verbal agreement with uh, with the FCC to abide by the open internet rules in 2018 despite the fact that the open internet rules are of course no more thanks to Verizon uh, but there is this problem with Netflix going on and there are you know hints here and there and between that and the lobbyist money it's. I'm very concerned about everything that's going down right now. It's it, despite that. So this is purely uh, anecdotal, but I think everybody who's watching who's on Comcast probably has experienced this. Matt Vukash is a, a software engineer who wrote a blog post. He says Comcast is definitely throttling Netflix. He uses and despite the fact that you're right, this is uh, in violation of their uh, existing agreement not to do so. The problem is that Comcast owns its own streaming business, uh, Xfinity Stream Picks. So it's a it's a direct competitor to Netflix. The, so what he did is he tried Comcast he, over an extended period of time. He was getting terrible Comcast results on his network. He's a, a student. Um, and so he uh, he's at Indiana University. Uh, and he tried um, Netflix just without... Uh, you know, just direct connect. He was getting 235 kilobits per second over Comcast. 235 kilobits per second. That means he was at best able to get 320 by 240 video. <laughs> and it buffered all the time, of course. Then he did something interesting. Instead of getting Netflix directly, he used his in university's uh, VPN. Now, normally you wouldn't want to use a VPN for streaming video because the overhead would slow it down. Remember, without the VPN, when, when, when the ISP could see what he was doing, 235 kilobits per second. With the VPN, 3,000 kilobits per second. Comcast couldn't see into the encrypted tunnel, so didn't know to block that traffic. And despite the VPN overhead, he was able to get high-quality 720p video consistently over VPN. Um, he says, you know, he contacted uh, Comcast on two separate occasions. They found no problems with his Internet. Then he sa they said he'd get a follow-up call from an, a network engineer. Call never came. Um, I have to say, uh, this is pretty clearly, anybody who's used Comcast to watch Netflix knows, it, it doesn't work consistently. It's often terrible. And that's when Comcast, you know, is just the little old Comcast. Now it's going to be the cable town that owns everything. <laughs> I can, it can only get worse. Agreed. And, you know, I think the big, big thing we should all be thinking about is how can a company which controls the access also controls the content? Right. I mean, if they want to be the cable giant, they need to start spinning out everything else they own in the content side of things so that they can be in one business. So this at least gives some power back to the content owners. So if you are a cable company and you are going to dictate the terms, so now they're going to be so big that they can dictate terms to content owners like ESPN and everybody else. They can dictate terms to internet companies like the the you know the Netflix of the world. I mean, this is just insane to think that we are dealing with a merger like this. We've been there before, and we are making essentially one more too big to fail kind of a corporation. And and the problem is there is nothing as consumers we can do about it because our whole political system 
is so compromised. Just look at, you know, how many people come out of FCC and they go and go work for, for you know, cable companies or telephone companies. And the reason for that is like, why would they want to risk their own personal future and take any tough decisions when, you know, they know they have a cushy job waiting for them if they don't do anything? Like, they don't have to do anything and they just end up making these big giants winners. And, like, I am increasingly, you know, disp you know, not, you know, optimistic about the future of commercial internet in this country because it just is like a two two tier monopoly we have either the phone companies right. or you have the cable companies it's a duopoly yeah uh, well i maybe we can't just blame government which obviously isn't uh, the most activist in this but you might also want to blame ourselves i think that there's a certain amount of uh, fatigue even among geeks who know this is a bad thing um you know this week was the on Tuesday was the day we fight back, except everybody decided not to, to fight at all. Remember, we were supposed to have a big action on Tuesday against mass surveillance, call your legislator. Um, the good news is uh, 90,000 people did use the website to call their members of Congress. Um, I didn't see a lot it, on the net about this, though. It seemed like it was awfully quiet. Do you think it's surprising, though, that not that many people called in about this? This is a pretty complicated technical topic, right? I mean, this is not a simple thing to say, hmm, should I be disagreeing with the government about this? It I also feel like, me. I mean, we did SOPA PIPA two years ago. Same people. Seemed to be very effective. We actually stopped it, I think, uh, in yeah, well, Congress. But I think there's a certain I, amount of fatigue is set in. Well, yeah, I mean, you, I, uh, go ahead. I can, I can tell you that from, from a Cloudflare's perspective where I work, I mean, we had a huge number of our customers participating because we made it a one-click thing where you could say, on my website, show the banner. Um, and we've taken a very strong stand on this. So I think people did participate, but you've got to be pretty clued into what the issues are Maybe. to want to actually call your congressman. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, and, and you're in the UK where, of course, the GCHQ is, is just as bad, if not, not worse than the NSA and is feeding off the same trough of data the NSA is feeding off of. Well, I think the, the, the ironic thing is that um, whenever I hear Americans talking about this, this issue is that you have to have the perspective that you are talking about it in the context of a legal framework. There is actually a legal framework. What came out in some of the Snowden documents is that the legal framework in the UK is much weaker um so we were there's a long-standing tradition of government spying and so forth uh, the, and also you know there are other things going on in the uk like we have um filters on the, the internet right um yes. being pushed da by the government david so, cameron's famous uh porn anti-porn filters <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah anti-porn filters and now we've heard today that they want to extend it in some cases for extremist websites so that uh, yeah. you can't see certain sorts of content so that's a that's a slippery slope no kidding. What is extremist? Whoever doesn't agree with David Cameron, I would guess. I don't think what you have to be extreme to disagree with David Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is somebody who said that democracy is nothing but perception, and that's what it really is. Yeah. Getting proven every day. We see that our government spies on us. You know, people actually have very little respect for fellow citizens, and I think... The idea that the the, the British people, uh, you know, need need to be censored on the internet makes no sense to me. It's like, <laughs> wait, how does that even make any sense? Who is David Cameron to decide what is pornography or what is, you know, unfair uh, language? And I think that is where we start to kind of lose a little bit of um, of grip on on you know a little on society per se and i think i'm beginning to feel that more and more of this news comes out and more and more people around us are, be, are developing a certain apathy towards the whole thing it feels like this, that yeah and i think a lot it has to do with the incremental nature with which information right. is coming out like people are just like reading in you know you know in like tiny bits on the internet you know, remember that every time we've had big scandals in the past which led to major change, there were 
like consistent, like big uh, reports, which always laid context to the things which were going on and giving people an understanding of how it Im impacts them. I see much less of that happening, especially in the big media. And, and I see more of like, let's report on the news. Let's do some, you know, much slinging on people bringing that news or the information, you know, let's, let's much sling on the, the whistleblower rather than just talking about what is the big issue at hand. Are we going to be a, a different kind of democratic society going forward? How are we going to govern ourselves in this time of change and the internet? So I think instead of focusing on all those things, we are beginning to focus on all the ephemeral here and now things which which have much lesser impact. But, you know, I think as media people, as media entities, we need to take a step back and say, okay, what is the role we do need to play going forward? I think that's a huge challenge I find in, in on an ongoing basis. Like, I mean, I find really hard to grasp all the changes which are all the information that is coming out of the, the Snowden, uh, um, you know, files, I guess. And like, I still don't understand, like, how does it impact me, right. the world around me? And I hear a lot of the, the, the fireworks around it. I don't hear about the actual problem and what I it think means. maybe we can, it's harder for us to grasp the privacy implications, but this Comcast Time Warner merger impacts to me impacts the free and open internet and a lot of this impacts the free and open internet and can we not as geeks at least stand for that to stand to protect the internet it seems so important tim Wu wrote a, a great book about this called the master switch uh in which he said it's the nature of open networks to become closed uh he he uh, starts in the book he starts with talking about uh, the long distance telephone system but he uses uh cable uh, the cable and broadcast TV industries, the Hollywood entertainment industry, and ultimately the internet as examples of this. In other words, he would say probably, oh, this is exactly what you'd expect. The big, the incumbent, you know, you have a free and open internet until there's some real money to be made, then the big incumbents come in and say, yeah, we'll take it from here. Is that what's happening? I mean, that's what you really think, you know, is happening. I, the, it's not just that. I think the challenge is that we don't have anyone actually putting any oversight on these guys. No. Right? That's that's the bigger problem. Just like, you know, maybe some of us have no problems with whatever is coming out from what NSA is doing, but where is the oversight? What is the clarity on oversight? Why do we have a government if we don't know what it's doing? Why do we have FCC or FTC when we know that they're not going to do anything in favor of the citizens and look out for the citizens' interest? And I think... That is a bigger problem, more not not that these big companies are trying to become bigger. I mean, that's the nature of corporations. We need to find our ways to control and put like you know some kind of you know legislative controls on these companies, not like otherwise they run amok. like it's like i am I'm all for like you know full-on capitalism, but we still need some kind of rules and regulations to keep these guys in check. I mean, I think, and there is nobody who's going to do that. Like, that is, that has become more and more obvious in the last three to four years. The most, de most is, depressing is, thing is to see Brian Roberts, the chairman of Comcast and NBC Universal, golfing with President Obama, who's a big supporter for Obama, and then you got to, you have to think, God, he's not going to, this is, there's no way anybody's going to say no to this guy. It's you know just, what? it's house of cards, baby. That's right, it is. <laughs> You know, you I was that? watching that for the first time this weekend because uh, I was sick and I haven't gotten a chance to. So I'm like, you know what? I have a weekend. I'm you have sit down, to watch and of it. Course the, yeah, the second season just came out. You watched so all I of the first season, that. right? First? Yeah, okay. I just did that in like yesterday. I watched oh episodes 1 through 13 and just kind of mainlined <laughs> it. And now I'm on the second episode of the second season. And comparing this... Granted, House of Cards is kind of our alternate dark, darkest timeline version of the right. House of Representatives and, and the US I don't think government. the vice president's a murderer. Probably not. I don't think Joe um, Biden's killing people, but... He's too cute to kill people, let's be honest. <laughs> uh, but there are some similarities. I mean, yeah. there are there are politicians out there who are in certain companies' pockets. Yeah. Like, it, it is unfortunately 
what business has become down there. And How I can't were you watching it. Netflix? Was the speed pretty good? Actually, it wasn't too bad. Okay, uh, but I started watching House of Cards last night around 6 p.m. So I feel like it was like maybe off peak hours. But then again, House of Cards season two just came out. So maybe everybody's watching <laughs> it's all it. all peak hours now, baby. Yeah, I don't know. I think Comcast feels... Uh, feels uh, guilty because they wouldn't let me watch the Olympics this week. So. Are you a Comcast customer? I am, yeah. unfortunately. I used to be a charter customer, and yeah. they're not that much better, but uh, I but got into suck. a tiff with them this week uh, because I I have a TV-internet combo, and the TV allows me for basic cable and HBO because it was a special deal, so I could you know watch Game of Thrones legally. Uh, but apparently... Paying that much money per month and getting that cable does not include me watching the Olympics, despite them advertising being what? like, if you're a Comcast subscriber, you have to be on the, if I paid $60 a month more, oh. I could be on that tier. But apparently NBC Sports is the second tier oh. up, so you can't just pay for television, you have to pay and, for And you don't have extra. it on demand? It's not in your on demand? It is in my on demand. That's the hilarious thing is it shows up as like, watch the, you know, short program for the pairs yeah. skaters. And then when you tap on it, it's like, I'm sorry, you don't have this. Uh, you don't have this subscription. It's like you're not paying $100 a month yet. Got to keep working on it. Get that <sighs> bill up, up, up. But Ohm, you wrote uh, right after this merger that it isn't about cable television. It's about broadband. Yeah, they don't really talk about the broadband part mostly because... They don't disclose their margins on that business. They didn't don't disclose a lot of stuff on that business, mostly because it's it's very profitable to them. I think interesting. And and you know, I think there is. I mean, I wrote a post about this a little while ago, which compared like how much, you know, how much frequency they need or how many channels they need to to pump out broadband and like how much money they have to spend. To get content for those networks so compared to that the the broadband networks are just more profitable that's encouraging in a way i you know i remember talking to cablevision many years ago and they said we just can't make internet work we have to sell you know from a business point of view we have to sell premium content over cable hbo and and the and the, and the olympics over cable because the economics of internet are not good but you say it's not the case that in fact the internet business is the fastest growing it has the highest gross margins. Uh, and, of course, you don't have to negotiate with anybody for programming. Does this mean that Comcast or a unified Comcast Time Warner Cable would, would head toward being an Internet company particularly? They already are an Internet company. Look at, you know, they have 90% plus margins on their voice business. Well, that voice business runs on the Internet, right? Like right. On the Internet part of their network, right? right? So it's like they are making so much more money from these things and they will continue to make more money. I mean, what would you rather give up, the cable connection or the internet connection? I can guarantee you there is at least in, you know, people who are like 20 to 40 years old, they would rather give up their cable connection than they give up their internet connection. Well, especially right? since I can watch House of Cards on, on internet and I can't watch it on cable. Right, and I right. think that's that's where it's at. Like the, the money in the future is going to come from the internet connection. I mean, think about this way that your, whether it's your Nest or Hue or any of those internet of things, things you might have in your home, right. your iPads, everything needs internet connection. So yes. that's a business they will control and they will increase the prices on that just the way they have increased prices on cable because there is no competition. And don't be surprised if you're paying almost $150 a month <clears throat> for your internet connection in two years or three uh, years. You know what? I'd pay that if it were good, fast, and reliable. I mean, I pay $40 a month. Yeah, but we've for, heard you're, you've got this apartment and you got the thing and it, you're in a unique situation. Do, no, do, I made this my unique situation. I will not move <laughs> into any building which I have to use Comcast or Time Warner or Verizon. I am all for supporting independent ISPs. I wonder, you know, we have a great independent ISP up here, SonicNet, and they, you know, consistently come out on top in terms of fighting the government when the government asks for information, of providing better service. They're growing fast. I wonder if this isn't an opportunity for a company like that. The problem is they don't have access to the cable copper. They only have access to the DSL copper. The FCC allows 
uh, uh, the cable companies to say, no, nobody else can use this. We, we paid for it. It's ours. While they require, I'm not sure why, I, the phone company to open up their uh, network center to, to other competitors. It has to do with how they're regulated. Um, I did some research into this because I ended up doing a, a comic a while back for Common Cause. Uh, it's a little bit crazy and it's really frustrating because it comes down to who owns all of the all of the wires and if you're a smaller company you have to rent either forcibly try and rent from the bigger companies right. or be you know be a satellite company which requires owning a satellite or yeah. renting time off a satellite which is just crazy so we, we're stuck with this duopoly that the government created actually the there is another way of thinking about it you talked about sonic net the reason sonic net delivers what it does it's not just because it can you know get uh, access to the phone companies phone lines it also is building its own network and it is doing you know things in a much smaller fashion which allows the company to expand in a more you know in a more a thoughtful sort of a way i think building a nationwide network is very expensive but you can build out networks in in small cities or small neighborhoods, just like your ISP, which is Sonic.net, has done, or my ISP, which is Webpast, has done, is they've gone after very specific niche markets and then used that to expand their base and become a business. And I think the only way to build out independent ISPs is through having a very small and focused approach rather than having a national approach to building out a, an, an ISP. And the technologies are pretty, you know, the, the, the equipment we need and all those things we need uh, to make a network is not that expensive anymore. I think the cost- Is Google Fiber a, a viable option, for instance? If, if Google wants it to be, it could be a really good viable option. It, how ex and, But it's gotta be, I know when Verizon was doing Fios, they said it costs us $5,000 per customer to get fiber to them on average that's a that's you got to pay 100 bucks a month for a long time to make up five thousand dollars right but that was also eight years ago right right so things the great thing about technology is everything does get cheaper yeah i mean the google network isn't that is much cheaper compared to those guys because they went into one small city set it up now if they went went to like maybe 20 cities like that every year maybe you know, somewhere between five to twenty billion dollars, right? I mean, and if they can turn those those uh, networks into networks for, like, which ensure video advertising to their products, I mean, they can pay off much faster. I think there is clearly, like, the, the, if there is any hope of competition on a national level, it would be Google. On a on a on a on a regional and a small city level, I think. A lot more people should be thinking about ISPs. I told the guys from from um, from Sonic.net that they should open source their their network architecture plans so that other people can copy them that's and roll them out. Right? Yeah. I think that's what we need to be thinking about. How do we actually overcome these guys? Maybe it's time to think about an alternate independent internet which is not controlled by you know, phone companies. I think that's what you get. If, if you get a com, in some ways I want a, com a Comcast Time Warner Cable a merger. In some ways I want the big companies to screw it up. Uh, to, yeah, block Skype, block Netflix, ruin the internet. Please do, because I, maybe th then that will stimulate geeks uh, to do something different, to create a new uh, pro internet that is not, you know, run by these companies. Well, is in that theory it'll create outrage from your average user too yeah. because the you yeah. know most people don't care but if suddenly oh wait i can't get my netflix why can't i watch the new season of orange is the new black there What's you going go on? Ah! and they get angry and call their congressman when they is, talk about is it neutrality. viable though is it is it i mean that's the question uh, uh, rights of way the cost of the trenching the cost of the fiber is it possible to create... That's what they did in your building, right? Um, they bought a wholesale internet and then created, in effect, a building-wide internet right? service provider, right? That's correct. So they are in 
all the high rises in south of market in San Francisco. I mean, it works in an urban area better, of course, because there's a higher density of population. There's more chance to make. But money. think think about it this way. I think uh, Lee Gallagher wrote a book called The End of Suburbs, in which he talks about how we are all moving back to the city. Cities are becoming bigger and bigger, which is actually not such a bad thing. It allows alternate internet access models to emerge, right? Because you have a much more dense population in, in an urban area. You can actually build out an alternate internet right there. Right. And I think there is something, something needs to happen clearly. I think we cannot expect our government to do anything for us. We no. don't expect FCC to do anything for us. So I think it is time for geese to stop thinking about, you know, apps which let us share secrets and, you know, work on things which allow us to build out a network, which is truly a network for, for, for use and not like controlled by this big giant corporation. I think it's time for people to, to think about it in a more serious manner. We talk about the how worst. Is the, how is the the Google Fiber thing a good thing? That, I think that's kind of a scary thing. Now, not only has Google got my email, my calendar, every single other thing, they actually have the Fiber coming into my home. I mean, there there will be a terrifying prospect. You'd have Google. I, I find them more scary than Comcast. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like Google's a lot more transparent. I mean, uh, any internet service provider has has access to everything you do on the internet. Uh, so the uh, only question is which one you would trust more. And you're saying, well, you obviously, you live in England. You don't know anything about how bad Comcast is. That's the problem. Well, I, did, I, did, I did live in the U.S. for a long time. And I do remember that Internet access absolutely sucked. <laughs> absolutely everywhere. And that, interestingly enough, coming back to Europe where everything's heavily regulated, I have a 20 megabit Internet connection that cost me $25 a month. And I have a choice of companies. Comcast so, has consistently been voted... The worst company in America, and by consumerist. Although this year, Electronic Arts beat them. Not a surprise. <laughs> but that's another story. Um, that's Sim. <laughs> that's Sim City, dude. Yeah, the Sims and everything else. Believe me, if you've no, ever... just Sim City. Not just Sim I'm... City. No, 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 Ohm. It's much worse than that. <laughs> You've had a long Dungeon series Keeper. of problems. I'll give you Dungeon Keeper, which just came out on the iPad, and you cannot play it. It's a free game, except that you can't play it, really, unless you give them lots of money for gems. I had to buy a Windows machine to play SimCity. Oh, you got robbed. You got yeah, robbed. <laughs> but so good. So good. Uh, but you're right. SimCity was, a, was a, one of the reasons EA was named the worst company in America this year. The other thing, that Comcast consistently rates below the IRS on the customer satisfaction index, below our, uh, our, our national tax collection agency. Um, so believe me, I don't want Comcast to get any bigger, but I think, uh, the problem is for most of us, I don't have a, I'm a Comcast customer. Actually, we're Comcast customers here and at home and, uh, we don't have much choice. They're just in most areas of the country, you have two choices, the phone company. Well, you have three, if you include satellite, the phone company, the cable company, or a satellite. And, uh, it's getting worse all the time. Oh, one more thing. And then we'll go to a break. Uh, Comcast customers, you might want to change your password. Turns out Comcast has been hacked, and they're they're downplaying it. Null Crew uh, hacked into at least 34 of Comcast's servers, published a list of the mail servers, and a link to the root file with a vulnerability it used. This vulnerability has been around for a long uh, time. Comcast has known about it for a long time. However, uh, they never patched the vulnerability. Um, well, many others did but not, just not Comcast. And so um, Violet Blue writing on uh, the Zero Day blog on ZDNet says, as, and I, as soon as I saw this, I did change my Comcast password. Change your password. Uh, while Comcast isn't talking about it, they're, they're using the uh, Snapchat method of, uh, of cover-up. Um, it probably would be a good idea if you, uh, if you value your email to change your password. I feel bad for anybody who's from... using a Comcast email. <laughs> That, that, that's what I was going to say. Who uses their ISP email address? Well, I use Gmail, but I do have, if you have a Comcast account, you have a Comcast email bag, and it may be that, in fact, there's stuff in there Comcast sends you and so forth. They send you pretty, uh, pretty detailed information. Yeah. Um, they will send you, I think, billing statements and yeah, things like that exactly. if you're not careful. Yeah. Might, might want to change that password. Serenity Caldwell is here from Macworld.com. Always great to have you. 
Uh, Always great to be here. Buried in the snow in beautiful Baston. Ohm Malik from San Francisco, gigaohm.com. And don't forget om.co, his personal blog. I go there every week to see what he's reading. And uh, his reading list is very, very uh, juicy. This is a beautiful blog. Uh, om.co. Omco. And uh, from uh, Great Britain, John Graham Cumming, programmer, Cloudflare. I, f I forgot to mention Cloudflare. What yeah, do you look? Here's the Cloudflare t shirt. What do you do at Cloudflare? Well, I help us build a better internet. That's what we're trying to do. <laughs> oh, so good I'm man. Cloudflare is used by a lot of companies uh, to uh, uh, protect against DDoS attacks, uh, right? I mean, that's one thing. Yeah. That's one thing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. There's many others. I mean, we are all about building a better experience for people on the internet by building out a better internet. And so that starts with the websites. And part of that is DDoS protection, and part of it is making them faster, and part of it is making them available all around the world. Good. Are you a, Is it a CDN as well as a, a bandwidth provider? Yes, that's part of what we do as a CDN. So we do all the sort of caching type yeah. things. But ultimately, people who use... Uh, Cloudflare services, their whole website is on us, not just the static ah, assets. Got it. What's that uh, floppy disk behind you there? Over your le oh, right shoulder? Well, obviously, that, oh, this one over here, that's, yeah. that's an 8-inch floppy. Yeah, so I recognized it. Yeah, that's actually just some code I have lying around. It's some assembly language code for a Z80 processor. Ah, um, did you write and it? That's, yeah, yeah, that's some code I wrote in uh, I like 85, that. I think. I should frame my right. assembly language code, put it on the wall, too. Well, I just have it because it reminds me that, you know, disks discs existed, first of all, and they were that big. So Remember when, um, it's, remember when it all started. Yep. Yes, yep. I do. Yep. John has a great tumble log. We'll talk about it later on in the show where he keeps code snippets that you might see in a movie. Um it's an interesting story. I want to talk about that a little later on. But for now, I, I want to talk a little bit about another company that helps put you online, Hover.com, the domain registrar that makes it clean, simple, and easy. Uh, we love Hover. All my domain names are registered with Hover. When you have a great idea, you want to get a domain name for it, you want something good, catchy, memorable, go to Hover.com and get it. Uh, it makes it very easy. They do all the top-level domains, dot, uh, .com, dot .net, dot .org, dot .tv, dot .pro, dot .mobi, dot .biz, dot .io, all the, dot, all the popular country codes, dot .ca, dot .asia, dot .us, dot .uk. Actually, dot .tv is a country code. I have twit.tv through hover.com. It makes it very easy, too. You know, a lot of these registrars, you, you say, I want a domain name, and then you have to click a thousand times... Oh, what are those new ones? Some new domain uh, TLDs. Dot camera? Really? Dot equipment? Dot estate? Dot gallery? Dot graphics? Dot lighting? Dot photography? Wow. I can't gone cuckoo. That's cool. These are all available at Hover right now. When you buy a domain name, you don't have 50 clicks. They don't. They make it very straightforward. You. They know, for instance, that you'll you'll want who is privacy, so that it's included in the price. Boom, jump. Subdomains URL forwarding as well. Um, the, the domain registration uh, is easy, but so is domain management. Couldn't be simpler on Hover.com. Um, I've I've found it completely just clean, simple, and beautiful. And Great support. Should you run into a problem, you uh, you get uh, business hour phone support Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time, guaranteed to speak to a live person who's empowered to help you to get the job done. They're eager to help. And, of course, help at Hover.com is there as well. I've got 22 domain names registered at Hover. My kids, the TV. I got my kids' domain names right away when they were born. They don't want them, but someday. I registered abbylaporte.com through 2020. I figured if she doesn't want it by then, I probably should just give it up. But they've got, you know, they got it through January 2020. Um, it's kind of fun to see this. These are some of the older sites. When I when I got my ham license, I got my ham uh, call sign at Hover. You're going to love it. And we've got a special deal for you. Hover.com slash twit2 to register your domain name and for 10% off your first purchase, use the offer code TWIT2. We're in February, so you get it. Hover.com slash TWIT2 
Uh, use the offer code TWIT2 to save 10% off your first domain. They also have Google Apps, which is nice because they support it. So you get you can get Google Apps for the same price you get from Google, but with support from Hover.com. So that's really handy. You can add email to any of your domains as well. Very sweet. Hover.com slash TWIT2. We thank them for their support of this week in tech. I think we've covered the Time Warner thing sufficiently. We're just going to have to watch with interest. I'm not sure what the timeline is. Am I right, Omen, saying that it is the FTC, FCC, and the DOJ? I mean, DOJ is on antitrust. It's going to go through that pretty sweet. Easy. Maybe the FCC will have something to say about it. I think we should have something out in like three to six months. Though okay. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if Charter Communications makes a hostile bid for Ah. Interesting. Because they were interested in buying them, and we haven't heard anything right. from, from them just yet. So my view is that we shouldn't rule that out just yet. Interesting. Because Charter was looking at Cox Cable. See, this is very much like this, the mobile phone market, where you get this sudden, whoosh, it goes from you know, six companies down to two in, in a matter of time. We saw it happen with radio. They right. killed radio, thanks to the uh, lack of oversight from the FCC. Uh, now, now it's going to kill uh, cable and the internet. Google's uh, acquisition of Nest is final. They now own the thermostat company. I don't know what they're going to do with it. There's nothing creepy about that either. About your thermostat. <laughs> uh, you don't. Are you afraid? Or what are you afraid of? What do you think Google's going to do with all that information about you? I, I think that once you have that much information, the temptation will be to do all sorts of amazing things with it. And if Google has my ISP and my email and knows when I'm home and what the temperature is, I mean, you know. So what? To, uh, well, I, I just think it's too much power in one company. You know, it's it's centralization of way too much information. Yeah, but I, I, don't... I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with John. I think people underestimate the cloud Google has both in Washington and increasingly on our internet lives. And I, I won't be surprised, you know, they, they have more control on it. I think, again, they are one of those companies which is going unchecked because they have managed to, you know, circumvent the whole political system really well. They've found the right lobbyists, right, you know, they've done everything right to ensure that they are in business for a very, very long time. And they have basically taken care of all the right politicians to keep moving. I mean, <laughs> you know, Eric Schmidt has dinner with President Obama. I think that just is the what we need to really know, right? The picture says more than any amount of headlines would say. But but what what are they I'm I mean, I'm I understand that, but to me it just means a better Google now. Uh, you know, hey, <laughs> I see you're not home right now. You know your thermostat's at 84. You want to turn that down? I don't, do, do you anticipate some horrendous result? Like uh, what they're going to say, oh, Leo's home. Telemarketers descend on him. Is that what you anticipate? I don't. Uh, I mean, why not? Why not? Why not have you called up as, yo, he's home. He'll definitely answer the phone. And, They're um, not going to do that. I would immediately. Why that, not? Because then you'll Why disconnect not? all your stuff. You'll go, I don't like it. They've got a balance between, you know, Google is collecting all of this information, uh, but they can't outwardly just be like, oh, we're going to sell everything publicly and you're going to immediately know about it. Because, yeah. yeah, then people would stop. I mean, there are definitely questionable practices going on at Google with the data that they're collecting right now. And it's true if you're using a free service that you are what is being sold Tar uh, targeted I ads don't... do not bother me i don't i think yeah. that's a better ad than a non-targeted ad i don't i mean it's annoying to like visit a page for a baking instrument and then see that baking instrument on 30 different web pages that you visit because it's, it's a little freaky but still i mean at least they know what you like i i just don't see google using that going into the you know the thermostat space and using that as a as a tool oh this person only likes uh only likes it really warm maybe we should market sweaters to them it seems <laughs> but that doesn't I mean, again I, I don't really uh, see okay so i see sweater ads uh, it's i mean i'm gonna see ads anyway right wouldn't you rather see an ad for something you'd like than something you don't care about 
What's wrong yeah, with that? Sure. I, no, th there's nothing wrong with that as you describe it. What I find creepy is the idea that Google will know when I'm home, um, will know how many times I burn the toast because I set the smoke alarm off. Your I neighbor knows that. Yes, but my neighbor doesn't aggregate everything else about me <laughs> and then use it to sell me something. The neighbor right. comes around and says, hey, when you shut the snow smoke alarm off, it's wake woken me up. Uh, I think the Google, I think it's natural for any large organization to just to get larger and larger and larger. And there's way too much, you know, way too much um, information there. And, you know, why the hell did Google buy a thermostat company for $3 billion? And also at the same time, buy a lot of robotics companies. No, I'm sorry. It's uh, it's too much. <laughs> okay, I'm, I understand the 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 creepy factor, but that's a that's a visceral reaction to something. I'm just trying to find a rational reason why. I mean, I understand emotionally why this is uh, uh, disturbing, but I'm just trying to think of what the rational outcome of this that is so horrific is. And is it is it the case that uh, what we do is we say? I mean, it's certainly the case we. I guess it is what we do with people. If, if as soon as a company gets too big, we we want to cut it down to size. Well, it's nerve wracking a little bit when everybody is go Google in particular has shown that it is not interested in just one market. It wants to control multiple markets. And I think that might be some of the pushback that they're receiving on Nest because by snapping up the Nest team, not only are they getting Nest, which is a pretty cool device in the Nest Protect, the smoke detector, uh, but they're getting the entire Nest hardware team. And I think that's the real coup for Apple here yeah. or Apple for Google here is that they're getting ex Apple people. They're getting uh, they're getting really talented hardware engineers, which may signal the fact that Google's going to make a play for the hardware space beyond, you know, the the Q, which is a terrible failure, failure, and the Google TVs, which were partners, and, you know, the Android phones, which have been partners. Uh, Google let go of Motorola to buy Nest. You know, there's it's there there's some interesting things there. They're, they're branching out, which I think scares a lot of people. I think the key thing to think about Google... <clears throat> and Nest acquisition is that what do they do, right? Like every company in order to grow has to find a new revenue right. stream, right? right? So they are... Especially if still, they're a public company, there's huge pressure. Right. And they only have one revenue stream right now, which is advertising. And even on the Android side of things, it still drives advertising. It doesn't drive the any other kind of revenue so they need to find new revenue schemes and i think google fiber is one of them as an option for them to drive business and similarly you know it won't surprise me if tony fidel heads up android in two uh, years from that would make sense a year actually. From now, yeah right i mean he is the best equipped person to run that group. He's the best equipped person yes. to help them expand into different hardware groups. Now think think about it this way, that Google understands the internet being native internet company. It understands data better than most people. What it doesn't understand is a very human software interface, right? And I think something like that comes from a guy like Tony mm -hmm. and his team and it starts to all add up. And I think it's a it's something, again, we will understand about this in two years from now, right? The What are they going to do with the robots? I don't know. But, you know, there is, it is the prospect of what they're going to do with robots and, you know, self-driven cars and all those things. It just is scary, mostly because, you know, we don't know how this company is going to behave in the future. So far, they have a mixed record when it comes to dealing with human beings, right? So it just is a little bit, it, it, the company may, is beginning to make us queasy because it's becoming increasingly more, uh, you know, it's, it's tentacles are spreading wider and wider and it's going unchecked. There is no competition for Google if you really think about it. No. They, they have, uh, you know. But you know how we stop it? We stop using Google. We st if people are really worried, stop using Google, stop buying nests i mean nobody's making you do this isn't that the no. best way to make to limit google's growth just stop using it are you yes. gonna use microsoft bing from now on well me i use duck go go duck go go duck 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 go go 
<laughs> I tried to use that. I, I did an experiment using DuckDuckGo for a, quite a long time, actually six months. And um, it's the horrible. number of times I – yeah, it doesn't it's, – it's, Google it just, works. Yeah, unfortunately, Google works extremely well for search. Uh, I don't I don't have any problem with Google and search. I have a problem with my smoke alarm knowing where when I'm in the house. And, you know, the moment that thing starts talking to me and advertising to me, um, you know. <laughs> who's 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 the worst? Who's more a, who's more a threat on the Internet, Google or Comcast? I um, dislike Comcast far more than Google. Yeah, I kind of like Google. Maybe I, mean, I won't I always my, like them. Yeah, I have my beef with I, Google, but at the end of the day, at least I can, you know, I feel like Google is more of a responsive company than Comcast yeah. is. Comcast is very much stuck in its ways, which I suppose on one end could mean that it's the less dangerous of the two because it's going to be a they're, dinosaur. They're basically. old and dumb. Yeah. Yeah. Google is us. Google is our people. But Google isn't at all responsive, is it? I mean, have you ever tried to get phone support from Google? I mean, you can't get them on the phone, right? Comcast, you can get somebody on the phone. Yeah, I don't think you want to get the people on the phone that you get on the phone when you get Comcast on the phone. That is not a good experience at all. I just would say one thing, Leo. Google is not us. Google is them. Believe it or not. But they're kind of like us, aren't they? No, they're not. No, 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 no. Oh, really? Okay. Why aren't they not like us, um? Ooh, I mean, that's just is a long conversation. Much <laughs> you think Larry and Sergey aren't just geeks who uh, had a hit and they took their money and they said, hey, this is great. we got a ton of money. Let's go buy a Zeppelin hangar, a couple of jets, and some autonomous vehicles, maybe some robots. That's what I would do if I had their money. I would buy, the, buy, I would buy a jet and go around the world and just hang out. Oh, see, that's why you'll never be a great success, you see. <laughs> I'm okay being moderate. You got to work harder, Ohm. <laughs> no, Doesn't don't matter. Travel around the world. What are you, nuts? No, I'm old. <laughs> I, I, but seriously, don't I feel, okay, maybe, and maybe this is just me, but I think Serenity agrees with me. They feel like they're more our, part of our culture than Comcast does. Yeah, I think they've done a they've done a fantastic job of marketing that idea that they're not evil. I don't know if I necessarily again uh, the "Don't be evil" slogan is funny, and I don't necessarily think that that Google has become evil, but I I'd put them closer to the good part of the spectrum than I'd put Comcast. Comcast deliberately manipulates and you know and plays with its users. Google manipulates its users but is usually pretty upfront about it or it's like yeah we're taking your we're taking your data and using it for ads if you don't like it you can go somewhere else comcast is like we're going to pretend that you can get this stuff and do this and instead we're going to you know under the we're under the surface we're going to limit your uh limit your speeds and prevent you from getting certain things you know i i Google has a dashboard where they tell you exactly what they know about you. They give you control of it. You can download every bit of data that you've ever put on Google with their data takeout. I just feel like this is a company that understands our concerns and, but, and does what they can to, to give us control of it. Um, I mean, maybe maybe five years from now I will deeply regret it, but it feels to me like this is a this is providing a service. I like I like what I get from Google, and I, I don't feel like there's a threat to me from Google. You no, know, I think what I'm saying is, and I think John is saying is, we need to have a healthy skepticism of them. Yes, we should not believe that they are doing this through the good of their heart, right? No, no they're doing exactly. it to make money. They're and, capitalist and, business, right? And when somebody says, "Don't be evil," there is a chance. You have a guilty conscience. That's why you came up with that line. <laughs> I right? think that comes from uh, them saying, we want to be a successful corporation, a business, but we want to do it not, by not being evil. And in the modern world, that's the right way to do it because evil will out. The internet lets everybody know what's going on. And a company like Comcast is going to, people are going to know they're evil. So we better not be evil. That's the way to success in the modern world. I think that's reasonable. Yeah, and also, you know, remember the tagline of Fox Business is fair and balanced. Yeah, well, that's true. That's all I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> Do you think that, that their success is corrupting them? Power corrupts everyone, my friend. What are you talking about? Look at you yourself. <laughs> I am evil.
evil and proud of it. Um, Just mm. made sure that we were all on, on screen so that you don't have to meet with us in person. <laughs> <laughs> and anybody who has a chair like this is definitely, definitely evil. Yes. Hello, Mr. Malik. I've invited you here for one reason and one reason only. Do you think... Huh? Where is the bald cat? <laughs> I need a bald cat. We're, bring Shave my dog and bring him to me. Um, Google Watch, we're getting a lot of uh, buzz about that. We, everybody's been talking about the Apple Watch. Serenity, you cover this. Are, do you believe Apple really is doing a watch this year? I believe Apple's doing some kind of wearable technology yeah. and that it will likely at least preview at WWDC this year. Um, whether or not that's a watch, whether or not that's a fitness tracker, whether it's a hybrid of something, I think is too early to say. Yeah. There's lots of rumor and lots of speculation out there. I do think Apple will try and make a move into that market somewhere this year. I I think waiting another year, uh, unless they have something go catastrophically wrong with their other product lines, it seems like it's going to be too long of a time. Strikes me that the Google Glass has kind of lost steam. It's kind of a niche product yeah. to begin with uh uh most of the interactions that the general public has had with it is either gross fascination um arrest records or <laughs> the the word i'm looking for i probably can't say on uh on internet television uh people who aren't very nice wearing this uh, you mean naked I'm, people <laughs> um or people who just have an attitude problem about Oh, I'm a Google Glass explorer. Oh, glass holes. That's the yes, word. Yes, glass holes. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. I, I knew there was a more politically correct term. <laughs> glass holes uh, is the right word. <laughs> yeah, I was talking with my colleague, Dan Morin. Um, he was going to a conference this weekend, and I guess he ran into uh, ran into a guy wearing a Google Glass, and someone was asked, like, is that Google Glass? And the guy looks at him and glares, and he's like, what else do you think it would be? You fool. <sighs> Peon, do you not recognize yeah. the the explorers are not really giving them a very good uh, a very good reputation, Can shall I we confess, say? And it's still buggy. When I see somebody wearing Google Glass, I really want to punch him. I, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah, like Scoble, like a, people come here. Is anybody wearing glass here? People come here a lot wearing glass, so I've kind of gotten used to it. But I do have to resist the urge to just slug them in the glasses. <laughs> I wouldn't with a watch. I don't know why. Watch. I mean, lots of people wear Pebble watches. That doesn't bother me. Well, the watch doesn't have a camera. And it's not on right. your face. You know, right. you're. It's if you're going to be filming from a watch, assume say Apple makes a mythical iWatch or something like that, and they put a camera on it so you can FaceTime. Um, if you're going to be FaceTiming, either you have to hold it up this way so it's going directly at you, selfie-wise. Yes, and your arm will get tired like it. Ohms is. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yep. Oh, God. <laughs> or you're holding it out, in which case it's very visible. With Google Glass, I mean, yes, Google made a big deal of like, oh, yeah, we're not going to let apps automatically record you. But if you have something in front of your eye, A, you don't know if that person's paying attention to you or not because right. they you know, have the vacant They keep looking over yet. your shoulder. Yeah, exactly. You're like, uh, are <laughs> Hello? you paying attention? Yeah, exactly. It's the I'm looking at my phone while talking to you at the dinner table thing, yeah. only you can't tell the social cue. Right. So, like, that kind of stuff makes me mad. Having a watch is about as bad as a cell phone. Yes. Maybe a little bit more convenient, but yes. yeah. All right, we're, uh, that was awkward silence. No, I'm just thinking about <laughs> the problem. Is everybody I know who has glass doesn't wear it anymore? They just got tired of it. And every, and I had a Pebble watch. I got tired of it. Don't you just get? I mean, I carry my smartphone around because it does. It's it's pro, pro pragmatic. It it does the job. Does everything I need it to do. It's in my it's in my pocket. That's fine. I don't want to wear three different things. Keep it's an too open. heavy. Too huh? many things to charge. Yeah. Nobody wears wristwatches anymore, except for you, sir. I'm not sure why you're wearing a wristwatch. Nope. <laughs> I wear a wristwatch. <laughs> That's There's a certain class. It's yeah, but okay, what do you wear though, Om? Is it a is it jewelry or is it a Timex? It's not Timex, Jesus Christ. Why I... <laughs> it's jewelry. All right, that's different. That's that's jewelry. <laughs> it's not. It tells me time. It makes me feel good. Yeah, it's jewelry. <laughs> We're going to take... And by the way, if an Apple watch comes out, it better be jewelry. It better look good. Because, uh, you know, I don't want I don't want to look like I'm wearing a Casio on my wrist, right? Can you see Joni Ive letting an iWatch yeah, out exactly. of the lab? 
Exactly. If it didn't look good, even the pebble, the new pebble, the steel, it looks better, but it's still, you know, I have tiny little wrists. If that, that pebble is going to take right. up like this much of my wrist, nope. I need something that's actually going to look like I should be wearing it and right. not like I'm wearing a weird prototype, you know, 1980 cell phone. Exactly. It's like it needs a stylus. <laughs> no, no mm -hmm. woman or tiny man would ever wear it. We're going to take a, that's a terrible thing to say. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back with more. John Graham Cumming is here. From the UK, great to have you, John. Miss uh, Serenity Caldwell of the Tiny Wrists. Saturn on Twitter, S-E-T-T-E-R-N, right? Yes, that's Two correct. T's? Okay. Mm. And uh, from MacWorld.com, and of course, O'Malik, who is wearing a fine wrist. Come on, show us your wristwatch. No. <laughs> I know it's. I know it's something like, okay, so Ohm would never wear a Rolex because that's so obvious. But he's wearing something that is equally expensive but subtle, I would guess. That's just my guess. It's not very expensive. Oh, okay. It's just, it's I don't want to share the name. It's a German watch company. I love watches. I, I am not criticizing you. I, my I, watch company is it's a brand called Nomos. Nomos, okay. It's a great independent small company. Not I, very, but... I'm Googling it now. I want one. Okay. It's the watch that Ohm wears. Which one I wear, though. Ooh, these are pretty. Nomos Glashut. Very Bauhaus. And yeah, Bauhaus. very pretty. It was my gift to myself when I turned 40. See, that's and that's nice. And you can hand it down, and it's it's an heirloom. I don't these know are, about that. These are, <laughs> these are beautiful. Um, anyway, that's enough for that. These are, aren't they wear those watches? Aren't they gorgeous? I love them. Those are them. very pretty. Yeah. This is this is what Apple's competing against, frankly. They gotta have something that looks this good. And Google too. But you know Google will make an ugly one. You know Google will look like a geek watch. Our show maybe today it's brought Tony Fidel has otherwise. Ah, but maybe Tony can save it. You're right. It's Tony totally Tony was uh, in charge of iPod uh, when Apple uh, first did the iPod, and of course Nest is is beautiful. Smoke detector looks like a smoke detector, but I guess it has to. Our show today brought to you by Audible.com, a great place to go. 150,000 audio books, classics. Oh, 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 oh. They, I guess you can pre-order Influx. I'm excited. The new Daniel Suarez novel's coming out. I just finished it. Wonderful. Highly recommended. It won't be out till February 20th, so, but you could pre-order now and get it right away. And I'm going to tell you how you can get it and another book absolutely free. Michio Kaku's newest, The Future of the Mind, The Scientific Quest to Understand, Enhance, and Empower the Mind. That's coming out in just a few days. There's great stuff at Audible. What's nice about Audible now is uh, I think the publishers finally understand that we love audiobooks. We love them unabridged. We want to hear every word. Uh, we want them read not by some stiff but somebody who can really bring it to life, like Michael C. Hall doing Breakfast at Tiffany's. Now that's got to sound good. He's, of course, Dexter. <laughs> that's going to give a new slant <laughs> to Holly Go Lightly. Um, I am a big fan. They get the best actors, the best readers, reading the best material. You're going to love it, and I want you to try it right now. If you go to audible.com slash twit2, you'll be eligible to sign up for the Platinum account. That'll give you two credits. That means two books could be yours. You've got 30 days to listen. You can cancel at any time. The book is yours to keep. Here's uh, Leander Connie's uh, great new book about Johnny Ive. This is, this, we had Leander on the show. Really great. Simon Vance narrates it in his great Ponzi British accent. The genius behind Apple's greatest products. Um, oh, this is another great one. I think Brian Brushwood turned me on to this. Masters of Doom, How Two Guys Created an Empire and Transport Pop Culture. Will Wheaton reads that one. If you go to audible.com slash twit2, you'll be signing up for the Platinum Plan. 30 days. You cancel any time in the first 30 days. You'll pay nothing, but the book is yours to keep. You also get the daily digest of either the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal as part of the subscription. Really, really a great place to go. Try it today. Audible.com slash twit2. The hardest thing is... Picking those two books, but uh, pick well. Oh, is this new? The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes read by Simon Preble. He is a great narrator. What happens after a while with, with Audibles, you start following the narrators and you say, what else did he read? 
because you like the, like the reading so well. Audible.com slash twit2. We thank them for their support. The best code snippet on screen that I saw in your tumble log was actually Elementary from the TV show Elementary, John Graham Cumming. What was it? What was that one? I'm trying to remember. So this, it, what, what is the name of the tumble log? Source code? It's moviecode.tumblr.com. Movie code. That's right. Um, the idea is, how did, how did you stumble on this? Did you notice some code on a screen? Uh, yeah, so I watched the film Elysium at Christmas, and um, there's some code in it, and it's Intel x86 assembly language, and I was like, oh, I know that. And so I tried to figure out where it came from, and it came from an Intel manual. And I, I tweeted it just as sort of a joke, and so many people retweeted it. Uh, or replied with things that I said, okay, you know what, I'll just make a Tumblr and stick it up there. And then I actually only discovered three or four of the things that are on there. The rest of them are people have submitted them. There's a lot of code in the movies, and it turns out that uh, there's a great variety in the code in uh, in movies. Some of it is just cribbed from a website. Like they, they, they looked at the source of a website and pasted it in. Yep. And yeah, then some of it's WordPress. like like good. Well, that particular one you got there from Grey's Anatomy is complete and utter nonsense. That's <laughs> actually a real, so that's a really, really, really simple example in Java, and apparently it does something amazing with MRIs. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I love. The people who do these, uh, some of them are very sophisticated, but things happen. For instance, they may think that that screen is going to be in the distance in the background and suddenly it's front and center in the movie or the TV show. Um, and so, for instance, here's Iron Man 2, Mickey Rourke, remote controlling a war machine by writing an HTML doc type. Yeah, I'm not sure how that was going to work. <laughs> Apparently the, the, the robot understands HTML5. That's pretty I I exciting. But then you see Nmap, the, the hacker tool uh, used not only in Elysium, uh, but The Matrix and other uh, movies yeah. to do actual hacking. So sometimes it's yes. very accurate. Yeah, sometimes it's accurate and sometimes it's utter nonsense and sometimes it's hilarious. It just depends on, uh, <laughs> I think, whether the director really cared about it or not. Right. The funniest one is in a, uh, a documentary film to encourage people to code. Oh, yes, in Spain, where it looks like they just banged on the keyboard. <laughs> it's just, it literally is like, you're learning to code, and it's just... Random <laughs> <code>. <laughs> um, but I, I'm trying to remember the, what the elementary screen was, because it, it was the one that I thought, boy, this is somebody who knows a little bit about computers. Yeah, this is the Spanish Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports video, encouraging people to that. become programmers. And it's just what you'd get if you, if you actually fell face down on the keyboard. Passed yeah. out drunk. Yeah. So that, that actually is how programming is done. <laughs> uh, yes, so. <laughs> just in case you were wondering. Um, was, everything in Cloudflare was written just by banging on the keyboard. Yeah, so. exactly. Apparently using jQuery will help you guide missiles in the series uh, Strike quite, Back. That, yeah, jQuery comes up quite often as a, yeah, it's obviously much more powerful than you realize. You <laughs> A war with it or defend against <laughs> asteroids or anything. <laughs> so many things you can do. And yet here's Big Bang Theory with actual whiteboard code that is iOS app code. Yeah. I mean, that's not that surprising. They do tend to have a lot of little things in Big Bang Theory which are accurate. So right. the code is good. I wish I could find this one from elementary. I, it just struck me and I can't remember uh, what it was. But um, anyway, great site moviecode.tumblr.com uh, and if you've if you've got a screenshot of some code on uh, on, a, on a TV or a movie uh, you might want to share it oh here it is this is cool they used an obscure language I'd never even heard of it called malbolge oh, yes to yes, absolutely uh, yeah and it looks like it looks like uh, gibberish but it but it's supposed to be a, a code sequence and actually, if you run it, it will output the words, hello, world. Yes. I mean, that's, it's a rather simple program. But, that's yeah. good. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what they... That's good, though. That That's what Sherlock Holmes might have done. Yes. Yep. Um, moving right along to the, uh, the news of the world. Mac Pro. Wow. 
Ship date's now April. If you didn't order your Mac Pro from Apple, uh, you might regret it. It's now it's now three months out. What is there a theory on that, Serenity? Is it that they can't make them fast enough, or that people are buying them too much, or? I think it's probably a combination. I mean, the Mac Pro is the first Mac that they have made in the U.S. in quite some time, uh, and as a result, if there are if there is more demand than they expected to have, it's entirely likely yeah. that their their lines are backed up, or it's possible that maybe some component went awry. Uh, we didn't really hear a lot about the Mac Pro from Apple during the last financial call, which I find interesting. I've got to assume it's either a problem with the shipping lane or it's just been very popular and more slightly more popular than I think Apple had initially expected. And also, I mean, have you seen those things? They look like they take a, a while to, to put together and, and yeah, they're quite make beautiful. sure they're personally, properly yeah. machined. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't look like something some some minimum wage worker could assemble. It really Lots looks like high -end it's, machines. Yeah, it's beautiful. I have one. Uh, oh, did you finally get one? I think the last time we talked, you were waiting on yours. Uh, mine came, and uh, <laughs> I have the box. Just have it off screen. Yeah, here. <laughs> just I have it. I keep never opened it. I just keep it here. They're selling apparently on. Oh, here it is. They're selling apparently on um, eBay for a fifty percent premium. So if, I'm thinking I could make a little money on it. If you didn't mind waiting till April for your next one. You think the eBay buyer would recognize this as a stack of gaffer's tape <laughs> designed to look exactly like a Mac Pro? Maybe when he looked at the bottom, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, gaffer's tape goes for a for the This is expensive job. stuff. That's a lot of gaffer's tape. This is an ex <laughs> this This is like 150 bucks worth of gaffer's tape. More than that. Probably $300. <laughs> Ex-theater person here. I, I love my gaffer's tape. Oh, you can't, you know, it, people talk about duct tape. Duct tape is nothing. Gaffer's tape. Now that's what you want. Magical. Did you see the Steve Jobs time capsule dug up after uh, 30 years? This was uh, buried at an Aspen Design Conference in uh, 1983. Uh, he gave a talk uh, in, in which he talks about future technologies somewhat similar to the iPad, Wi-Fi, and the App Store. He used his Lisa mouse to help navigate through the talk, and then he put the mouse into a collection of miscellaneous items donated by conference attendees that were then buried as the Aspen Time Tube. Um, they, they lost it. <laughs> they couldn't figure out where it's been. Somebody found it, and there's a video on CNET of the excavation, and here it is. 30 years later, Steve Jobs, Lisa Mouse, worth actually less, if possible, than it was in the day it was buried. <laughs> Nobody wants that. I don't even know if you could connect it to any modern hardware. It's pretty funny. I doubt it, because everything on the Lisa was... Totally proprietary, huh? Yeah. custom and a nightmare to connect to anything, so... So there they are digging it up with a. This is on a a reality show, right? Called right. on the National Geographic Channel called Diggers. We did it! Look at that! Yeah, <laughs> There's a show I want to watch. Here it is. KG gets the sock. <laughs> makes the. What? Remember, time capsules were a big thing. Do they? Do people still do time capsules? Come right off in my hands! Holy crap! Holy oh, oh, the drama! of nectar of junk <laughs> there's a little plastic bag in there i reach in i grab it look there's a I gopro in it the like tube because I, I panicked like it was like a hot stove oh. couldn't be okay that's enough oh my god it's a lisa mouse <laughs> i've been looking for one of those <laughs> you can see the entire episode on uh, Diggers on the season premiere February 25th of the National Geographic. Potential value priceless. Potentially. Maybe not. Potentially. Actually, GoPro did a smart thing. I think that was a GoPro looking out right inside the tube. They decided to go public the uh, right after the Winter Olympics, and then they managed to make sure that every athlete at the Winter Olympics had a GoPro. So we've they're seen nice little cameras. Uh, they're great. I love them. 
I don't think I don't know if I mean they're marketed well. I don't know if they're unique hardware, but I I love I have several GoPros. Yeah, they're just built very well. I mean, they're very rugged for um, for what they their internals, and they're cheap enough that it's pretty easy to be like, yeah, I'll drop three hundred dollars on this HD camera that I can strap to myself somewhere and suddenly have video of whatever I want. Like, they have some use. Brilliant marketing. They gave uh, cameras to everybody, including the guy jumping out of the what is it, the free fall, the Red Bull astronaut, the 19, Stratos. Stratos. Yeah. Uh, they. Uh, they gave it to, to a loser. Let me see if I can find this in the Olympics. And uh, if you ever thought about taking up the luge, uh, you might <laughs> you might not you might not want to. Um, this this might discourage you. Let's see if I can find it. Matt Mortensen um, put it on his uh, helmet as he went down. I guess they get up to about uh, 130 kilometers an hour in these things. Here is the GoPro video on his helmet. From Sochi, I can. Can I show this? Uh, is this is this illegal to show? I don't think this is in any way imposing on NBC Universal's monopoly of the Olympics. God, this seems like a dumb thing to do. This doesn't look fun. That's, I guess, my problem. I like sledding. This doesn't look like it's fun. I guess it's kind of like going down a water slide, right? Except you're on ice and... And you're completely out of control <laughs> and you're going 100 miles an hour. Yeah. The luge doesn't scare me as much as skeleton. Skeleton is the crazy thing. Going What's down skeleton? Face, skeleton is luge only you're going down face first. Oh, no. Bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't think it was scary enough. Oh, when you were growing up, did you go sledding? Did you have a uh, American flyer sled and... I lived in first, Los Angeles. First time I saw snow was in 1991. So. Really? No snow in India at all? No. No. I mean, there is, but not where I grew up. Right. What did you think? Were you like one of those dogs that sees snow for the first time and you gingerly touch it and then you bounce up in the air? No, I thought this was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. As long as you don't have to and, shovel it. I noticed you ended up in California. <laughs> yeah, I think and then you realize that, uh-oh. It can get pretty messy very fast. Yes. That's the problem with snow in New York City is Ugh. it gets messy really fast. It gets slushy and then it ices and then it freezes and then it refreezes and it's horrible. So uh, good news. If uh, you are intersex, you can now declare that on Facebook. I know it got a lot of attention for this. I guess in the past the Facebook gender choice was male or female. Uh, Facebook has now allowed you to choose up to 10 different gender definitions out of 50 options so there's 50 options and then you could choose the one the 10 of them together <laughs> that seems very flexible um that's good though i mean i think that's great you can also choose your pronoun i think that's great yeah, it doesn't matter a lot to most of the population, uh, but to folks who are trans or folks who are, right. you know, in the spectrum. And I mean, that's really valuable. And it's really, it's nice of that Facebook is openly recognizing that and being as friendly as they possibly can uh, to folks who are um, trans or Whatever. cisgendered. Right. You know, it's, that's, that's really awesome. I think the, the big, the big thing is that social networks have to be reflection of society and people who make up those social networks so i think what what facebook is doing i think other people should actually be actively thinking about adapting their social software to realities of human beings right like doesn't matter you know like what kind of service you offer we all it's a social software this is made primarily for the people so well in fact it's almost even offensive that they uh Started off with so few choices, really. It is. It's my. This is my page. Shouldn't I be able to choose whatever I want? Yeah. I think kudos to Facebook for doing. Yeah, yeah, it's about right time. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, 2013's most charitable philanthropist, donated as much as a billion dollars to charity in 2013. Nine hundred ninety million dollars uh, by donating uh, 18 million Facebook shares. Uh, that's that's pretty good, although some have been a little have been a little more cynical about uh, this, pointing out that of course it's a tax deduction and it makes you look good and uh, and it does not replace federal funding. 
No, but how can you... The people who are cynical about this make me mad because, yes, sure, it's a tax deduction for him. Right. Um, but the money is still going, presumably, to people who need it. And it is still going to fund lots of fantastic right. programs. It's like when people get mad about Bill Gates and his, you know, all the fundraising and, and the stuff that he's done. It's, I, uh, you know, yes, you may disagree about maybe the kinds of charities that they're working with or that, you know, he's not giving away all of his money. But still, the fact that there is money going, being given away and being given to good causes is a thing to celebrate, isn't it? Absolutely. As long as, as long as you don't get people in government, which you do, who say, okay, see, we don't have to do anything because we <laughs> yeah. got Mark Zuckerberg. That's not how this works. Right. I think um, the, the big, the interest, I had a chance to talk to Mark about, about all this. And I can tell you, given that I have mostly written very skeptical articles about Facebook in my entire time covering the company, the one thing which impressed me the most about Mark was he actually genuinely believes in giving back, you know, and he believes that he's had a good fortune and he actually does want his money to actually impact people in a positive way. Good. It's not like some lip service or anything. Yeah. It's like he's actually a believer in this. And and I think, you know, giving, giving away a billion dollars for whatever the reason is still giving away a billion dollars. Like how many of us actually give away a penny? Forget right. about a billion dollars. Right. And I think he cannot mock somebody for giving away money to help other people it's difficult in fact bill gates always said this he said i'm reluctant to give away a lot of my money until i can spend the time i need to spend to make sure it's being used wisely because it's difficult it's actually difficult to give away a billion dollars and and give it away appropriately um but gates of course has been very active in going to other successful uh, tech entrepreneurs and saying are you going to do it too he got warren buffett to give away most of his fortune and a lot of others uh, so that's good absolutely Maybe don't send out a press release. Yeah, go ahead. Send out a press release. If it makes you feel better. We're going to take a break. Cheap words. The article in the New Yorker saying Amazon's good for customers, but is it, is it good for books? We'll ask that question of our panel. John Graham Cumming is here. Om Om Malik of Giga Om and uh, Serenity Caldwell, Macworld.com. Our show today brought to you by their folks at FreshBooks, a great cloud accounting solution that helps thousands of people like me, entrepreneurs, small business owners, Save time billing, get paid faster, keep track of their receipts, keep track of their expenses and their time and hours. Uh, I started to, you know, I've been billing for years, you know, using WordPress or not WordPress, uh, Microsoft Word or Excel to create the invoices. And it was just a pain. Some, some months I just would say, oh, I'm not going to do it this month. I'll do it next month. I remember sending a company a bill six months later and they said, we're not going to pay that. What are you crazy? <laughs> was, that, was, that was almost a year ago. Uh, so billing is a big deal, and it was always a pain until Amber MacArthur, uh, when I was up in Toronto, told me about FreshBooks. It was a startup in uh, 2004, and I started using it, and it really was great. It was a lifesaver, made it easy to create invoices, beautiful-looking invoices, easy to get paid. I could send the invoices by email with a button on the email that said, Pay Leo. That really did help getting paid faster. It's it's more now. It's a complete cloud accounting solution. Let's you... Uh, Let's you keep track of invoices, but also capture and track expenses on the go. Get real-time business reports with simple clicks. And you can try it right now free for 30 days. Visit FreshBooks. I'm sorry, getfreshbooks.com. If, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're still doing your invoices by hand, you got to check this out. Getfreshbooks.com, free for 30 days. And by the way, the delicious part of doing this, they're giving a birthday cake every single day to somebody who signs up for a new account, having heard it here on Twit. So when you sign up at GetFreshBooks.com, if you want to get in that drawing for the birthday cake every day, uh, enter This Week in Tech in the How Did You Hear About Us uh, section when you sign up. Give us a little credit, and you might get a birthday cake. GetFreshBooks.com. Did you guys read the uh, New Yorker article? Amazon, of course, uh, I've been fascinated by Amazon after having read Brad Stone's book, The Everything Store. Really interested in how it does business. Um, the premise of this is that by making uh, e-books inexpensive, by making books easy to get, they've Amazon has devalued the book. Uh, an independent publisher, Dennis Johnson, is quoted saying, Amazon has successfully fostered the idea that a book is a thing of minimum value. It's a widget. 
Does that seem reasonable? Is Amazon bad for books? It's bad for bookstores. Yeah, it's definitely bad for bookstores. I don't necessarily know if it's bad for books. Um, it certainly has created some problems in terms of books making excess profit. Um, but it's been, I feel like it's been really good for, really good and really bad for ebooks, but it provided a huge market for independent writers. Um, in That's the what I'm going to say. Amazon is good for yeah. authors. Very for good authors, for authors. Yeah, well, to a certain extent. I mean, uh, there is the whole kerfuffle about everything going on in the ebook sphere and about, you know, agency pricing versus non-agency pricing and how much that's actually making authors. Uh, in the traditional publishing model, Amazon, you know, it depends on, depending on how much uh, how many books you are selling, Amazon can be great for you or be terrible for you. For the average author, I feel like Amazon's really great because it's an easy way for uh, lesser known authors to really get the word out. And now that Amazon owns Goodreads, it's a way for them to sort of create a community and be able to touch base directly with their fans and their readers. Um, I, yeah, that, that New Yorker profile, I, I'm of two minds. I mean, I, I build ebooks for Macworld. So, you know, I have a very big stake in that game. Um, and while Amazon has done some great things for the books world and the ebooks world, it's also made, you know, it's made the, the paper book market a lot tougher. It's closed a lot of independent bookstores. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if I can, I can specifically go one way or the other about it. I have some good feelings about Amazon and what it's done for reading in general and for independent authors. And I have some really bad feelings about them as well. Amazon uses the wholesale model, a traditional model, where they buy, at least for physical books, they buy books at the wholesale price of the publisher authors, which is usually one half of the cover value. And then they set the price in the Amazon store, offer an undercutting uh, their cost. Um, App Apple does the agency model. In fact, Steve Jobs, one of the reasons Apple got sued is because Steve Jobs was a little bit too vocal about putting Amazon out of business with the agency model <laughs> in which they charge 30% of the price and the uh, and the publisher sets the price. And they also, uh, and then one of the reasons they really got in trouble, they also told uh, publishers they couldn't set a lower price anywhere else. Um, they couldn't sell the book for less anywhere else. Um, or, or that they could sell them for less, but Apple could dock the price to that point right. if they did decide. A, if they were going to sell it for $7 on Amazon, right. then it had to be docked for 7 bucks, which is really, it was a huge problem because, again, the as you said, Leo, the publishers weren't setting the price uh, with Amazon's right. wholesale model. Amazon was buying the book for, you know, say $8, and then they were undercutting themselves, and they could be like, oh, well... To make this book really, you know, sell in lots of numbers, we're going to discount that book to like six ninety nine or something like that. Um, and when Apple came into play with the agency model, Apple's like, well, we want to sell all of your books at nine ninety nine so that you guys get, you know, the maximum possible uh, money that you can get. Uh, but if Amazon decides to do discounting and Amazon's not on the um, on that model, we're going to be able to discount it right away. It's a uh, most favored nation. Is that the right clause? I yeah. Forget. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you said Google's too big. Is Amazon too big? They're getting pretty dominant in the retail space. Absolutely, and you're you're going to see them become even more dominant. And I think the whole books thing in which Apple got into trouble, I find it amusing that we are all beholden to Amazon when it comes to books. Like they don't really have competition. They have perceived competition in Barnes and Noble and Kobo. And Apple, I mean, Apple iBooks is a joke. I, I think that's, yeah. it's like the, the new Cube. You know, remember the Cube computer? Right. Which looked so nice, but the iBooks... Apple does a lot of that stuff. New Beautiful it's, things that nobody uses. Exactly. I have to and disagree I, a little bit on iBooks. As, again, as as a publisher for, for that, um, Apple has a decent amount of stock. Uh, I don't necessarily think that iBooks is the best reader around, uh, but in terms of the back end and in terms of developing for it, uh, iBooks and the EPUB standard is a whole lot easier for publishers and uh, and independent authors to build for than uh, the Kindle's Mobi for format and KF8. For I think absolutely sure. book publishers you know, went to Apple because they were terrified of Amazon. They're even more terrified now because iBooks has not become a big player in the same way that iTunes has become a big player in digital music. Um, according to this New Yorker article, Amazon represents, uh, for at least one major house 
a third of their sales on any given week headed towards about half. Uh, independence, less than 10%. Uh, one New York editor said only a third of the 3,000 brick-and-mortar bookstores still in existence will survive uh, if publishers don't waive their terms of payment. Um, bookstore, it's, it's clear that Amazon's strategy is uh, to dominate, sometimes by losing money on a product until they put the other guy out of business, and then they own it. Walmart used to do that. I, think, I don't think they're doing anything different. I think the thing which we should, we should you know, talk about is that the publishing industry itself was loath to change or experimentation. Right. And it is full of so much sloth. And, and I think the people who complain about Amazon or Google or anybody, even Apple, are people who are middlemen, people who are getting right. squeezed by the efficiencies of the internet-based systems. And I think, you know, Serenity is right. Like, you know, this has been great for independent authors and writers. Look at a lot of interesting ebooks which are coming to market. Again, they haven't succeeded at scale just yet, but I, I do feel that the, the publishing industry has to blame itself for, you know, finding itself in the position it is. Just like the music industry had trouble with its uh, with itself and you know they always blamed other people for their problems and it's like wait technology is gonna keep moving you either you get with it or you don't and figure out how to get ahead of it the the books business hasn't like you know even today you want like in, in we live in a world which is so here and now and and a book publishing schedule is like almost two years to three years between commissioning to publication and the whole process is so inefficient and Amazon is essentially trying to eliminate a lot of these inefficiencies. And I think, uh, you know, Mac world can write like a really great piece about Johnny Ive or ebook about Johnny Ive and have it in the market in in like a month, you know, that's what readers ultimately want, right? They don't want to wait three, three years after some, you know, big news events to wait for books to come or, I mean, there's a lot of inefficiency in the system. So, you know, we can't just blame Amazon for everything, you know. I think the publishing industry has to look inwards as well and ask themselves the question as to, like, how they can improve. Jeff Bezos always said that. He said, it's not Amazon. I'm just representing the Internet, you know. And uh, the Internet's going to put a lot of people out of business. Hey, let me ask you uh, about uh, this one, John Graham coming. Uh, because Cloudflare uh, wrote about it, the 400 gigabit per second NTP amplification DDoS. NT That's right. Yeah, NTP is network time protocol. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so what is this kind of attack? This occurred on Monday, but there have been more and more of these all the time. Well, this is the latest in a long line of what are called amplification attacks, where people misuse protocols that are based on UDP. And uh, what's interesting about a lot of these protocols is you can send a small packet and get a really big packet in response. And by forging where the packet's coming from, what you do is you send a packet looking like it's coming from the victim, and then some other server <laughs> probably sends a massive packet to the victim. And uh, these amplification things are really a problem because you can, as an attacker, you can have only a small amount of bandwidth at your disposal and suddenly turn it into 400 gigabits per second or whatever. That's, that's you know, a lot more, of bandwidth. Probably. Very few people have 400 gigabits per second to spare. Well, no, absolutely. <laughs> and in fact, what happens is the pipes get clogged and you're then talking about fighting it off yourself and then going upstream and upstream and upstream to, to drop. Uh, packet. So, these, but what's happened over the last, I uh, would say, two months is NTP, which is the network time protocol, has become very popular as people have realized that it has this enormous amplification factor. So, you can get hundreds of times the bandwidth you've got available uh, in the attack. And we've seen this one particularly big one on uh, earlier this week at the 400 gigabits per second. And I expect we'll just see more because this is completely viable and something people can do if they've got a grudge or an axe to grind. You have a diagram in the uh, primer that you wrote uh, showing how an attacker with a megabit per second, a one megabit connection, can then go to 10 compromised machines. Those mach You have to compromise those machines ahead or have them on a botnet, but those machines are then the trigger machines 
that because there's 10 of them, they have a gigabit per second. And then uh, those go to 400 amplifier machines, which amplify it by 50 times. By the time you get to the target machine, you're talking 500 gigabits per second, all from a single megabit attacker. That's right. Yeah, you can be sitting in a coffee shop somewhere, SSH'd into those 10 compromised machines, and then launch this kind of attack and take you know, a site offline or an ISP offline or probably a small country. Well, what is the factor uh, between the, the request packet and the amount of data that, that is delivered? Well, it depends a little bit on the protocol, uh, how large it is. In that uh, in that blog post, I, I talk about that. The the scariest one actually is SNMP, um, which has a 650x amplification factor, so you could get 650 times the bandwidth out through it. And a surprising number of devices have SNMP available on them on the internet. Simple network so management that's protocol. That's what's used to that's to manage machines remotely over the over the yeah. WAN. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And we have seen an attack using that. Um, now, NTP is a little bit smaller. It's in the 200 range, uh, 200 times. Uh, now, the lot. good thing, the, the, the reason people like NTP is that NTP tends to be running on servers. And those servers have got really good beefy internet connections so you'll find that you know a server running in a university somewhere or in a business might have like a gigabit per second connection and if you can then fill that up with packets then that's a good part of your attack right there whereas a lot of the snmp stuff we've seen has actually been on home routers so uh, we actually saw one from comcast some time ago um, where snmp was used so it's not just the amplification factor, it's how the machines you're using are connected to the internet. And NTP has become very popular because of the massive rate you can get out of it. Uh, is it is it possible to configure your NTP server if you run a time server to not be uh, complicit in this? Yes, absolutely. There, There's detailed instructions for all sorts of NTP servers. That are, in the uh, blog post I wrote, I linked to a lot of instructions for how to do that. And the other thing is that the underlying problem is the ability to do IP spoofing. Uh, because we can do IP spoofing from anywhere, then we can have packets of any protocol appearing from anywhere on the internet. And there is a thing called BCP38, which is a best practice for internet companies to not allow IP spoofing on your network. Now, if that was introduced, all of these problems would disappear because oh, spoofing wouldn't be possible. This is kind of like raw sockets? or I guess in order for, the, for this to work, you have to spoof... The server you want to attack, right? Yeah. And say, "Hi, give me some, give me a bunch of data." <laughs> That's me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You say, "Hey, there's this website on Cloudflare that I don't like." Right. I'm going to pretend I've got its IP address because, of course, you can get that. That's public. That's not a secret. <laughs> and then uh, you say, "Right, well, I'm coming from here. You know, uh, coming from that uh, address. Here's a here's a request. Of course, it didn't come from that address at all. That's the victim." And then the NTP server or the SNMP servers, oh, okay, here you go, here's your response. And you do that with enough servers, then things have been, uh, you know, knocked over or receiving a ridiculous amount of traffic. It isn't if hard. People want to check, go ahead. If people want to check if they've got an NTP server on the network, there's actually a thing called openntpproject.org. And you can put in your IP address or your network address, and it'll tell you if there is an open NTP server that you need to patch there. So if you go to openntpproject.org, that will that will help lock these things down. Even over the last week, we've seen about 100,000 servers get shut down. So please do that. It would help a lot. And this issue of IP spoofing, how uh, is that? Is it internet service providers, uh, network administrators? Who who needs to address that? So it's so it's really the people running big networks. So internet service providers, some very large. Um, of rail organizations which have packets transiting through them if they're their own, um, if they're essentially their own ISP. Right. So it's really something that, and it has to be done globally. When we, the attack we saw, I think there's a map in that blog, in one of the blog posts we put. I mean, this was truly an attack coming globally, hitting us. Yeah, from everywhere. Um, so uh, how hard, is there a reason not to block IP spoofing, or is it just well, laziness? There, uh, well, yeah, everything in the ISP business is about uh, how much money you can make, right? I mean, it's a very, right. very uh, margin thin business. So this is one of those things that is a bit of an externality. It's 
yeah, some some spoofed packets are coming from your network, it doesn't necessarily hurt you directly. You might get hurt by packets coming from somewhere else. So there isn't an in sudden incentive to do it. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is that the attacks are getting so big, and this one that we've talked about, you know, this week is enormous, that this really is essential that people start locking this stuff down because what we've seen is that pretty much anybody can be the victim of a DDoS and the DDoSs are getting larger and larger. And that means that ultimately you will end up being a victim. And so... And it's easy to trigger. So all you have to do is annoy a yeah. hacker. And yeah. Who was this big one against? Can you talk about that? Uh, no, we can't because the customer hasn't allowed us to say who it okay. was. The previous biggest one we'd had on us was 300 gigabits per second. And um, that was from, that was against Spam House, the anti-spam right. organization. Yeah, that was a very well-known attack. So yeah, we uh, try, when you say 400 gigabits per second, for how long? Um, that particular thing was running, I think... Where it was bothering us, it was about an hour. Jeez. And now whether the the attack may have continued longer than that, but um, you know, just looking at our own network graphs, we put in filtering and and right. it was gone. You were able to um, ameliorate it bef within an hour, but it could have yes, gone on I mean, for longer. That, I mean, what we often see is people uh, either think there's a DDoS coming that can be because someone's threatened them, or they're experiencing a DDoS, and then they'll sign up with us with Cloudflare, and uh, we will then very very quickly start protecting them and you know we've now ha fought off some really big ones i mean 300 400 gigabits per second um you know we, how we, sophisticated we do you have to be to launch this kind of a ddos an amplified ddos attack can a script kitty do uh, it or do you have to be a fairly sophisticated hacker i don't think you have to be very sophisticated at all the the amplification makes means you don't have to have that much bandwidth available there are tons of ntp servers that are out there available uh, there is code on github to launch attacks so really you don't have to be very sophisticated um it, the the actual filtering of it tends to be a bit more sophisticated just because of the data rates you're dealing with well that's good news i'm so happy we, <laughs> we brought this up now if you're not depressed yet meet mask the most sophisticated malware ever uh partly because it attacked macs windows and linux users uh, and it probably was state-sponsored. It's yet another one of these um, uh, viruses, these kind of omnibus viruses that are so powerful, um, like Stuxnet, like Flame. Remember we talked about this? That it seems like it's it's got to be a government uh, that, that created this, uh, particularly because of how it's used, who it attacks, the complexity of the attack, the fact that they... Want it to work even on mobile devices and, and any uh, operating system out there. It seems like it's not economically mal uh, motivated as much as it is perhaps espionage motivated and so forth. Uh, do you know anything about Mask, John, or is that uh, outside your... I, I've, also read, I've also read the reports about it. I mean, in, in terms of these, these massive malware things, I mean, we, obviously at Cloudflare we see these all sorts of malware attacking and scanning us and people Constantly. trying to break in. Yeah. Yeah, constantly. Actually, yeah, a couple of years ago, I looked at how, what percentage of the time we are under attack, um, and actually, it's now basically a hundred percent. There's always something under attack somewhere on our network. Right. Um, yeah. This, what we see actually a lot of is spear phishing. People trying targeted to targeted attacks. Us. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very targeted attacks. Um, that, that you know, they'll send you links, making it look like it came from somebody else, making it look like it's something that is relevant to you just to try and break into the system. Right. And that, you know, that actually scares me in some ways more than really sophisticated malware because people fall for that stuff and then they just hand over their passwords. Right. Actually, Microsoft themselves uh, recently uh, uh, published a, a report, a white paper that said that they estimated about one in five uh, Windows accounts uh, had been leaked by hackers mostly because people reuse passwords. And uh, if, if you search through the various databases of passwords from all these different systems that have been hacked, you, you find repeat, repeat, repeat. And, and they say about one in, tw one in five, 20% of all Microsoft passwords have probably been leaked now. Um, yeah, I mean, that's not really a surprise. I mean, it, <laughs> no. It, it, it's, it's just amazing, actually, the amount of repeat passwords people use. I mean, yeah. they use the same password for absolutely everything. And no matter how many password leaks there are, they seem to keep using the same password. So, 
I think it's sort of a, it almost shut their eyes to say, well, I, you know, there's so many millions of passwords being leaked, then my account is unlikely to get hacked. You know, probability wise, I'm one in 10 billion. Um, whereas, in fact, the reality is people would whiz through them and use them to send right. some spam or other things. I uh, I read Bill Gates Reddit AMA this week, so you don't have to. I'll give you the highlights in uh, just a moment. We're going to wrap things up pretty soon. Serenity Caldwell is here from MacWorld.com. Om Malik from Giga Ohm. Your hand getting tired holding that microphone? It's just flopped. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's on the ground now. Uh, and uh, John Graham coming from Cloudflare and uh, uh, many other places. The Geek Atlas is still out. Is it still available? Of course, of course. Go Love to it. Amazon. Even if, even if Amazon has devalued books, you can still buy it there. Here's one book it hasn't. Uh, <laughs> oh, and somebody yeah, reminds yeah. me that Kickstarter, we all got emails, has been hacked. Its password database has been hacked. Although I think that the passwords, I hope, were salted and hashed. Hashed and salted. Uh, yes, actually, they crossed. said that they were salted with multiple rounds of SHA-1. Good. And, uh, that was their old system, and they changed to using bcrypt about six months ago. So, so you're probably all right, right? Right. I, I, yeah, I mean, I would still change my password, but then, you know. I did. I'm parent. I I've, I change them. You change them anyway. You know what? Get LastPass or KeyPass or 1Password yeah. and just keep, you know, put strong, long passwords on everything, unique passwords on everything, and change them frequently. You don't have to remember them. Yeah, and, and, and service providers, of course, can use something like Cloudflare to actually protect themselves because, I mean, everyone's getting hacked at this point. It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, our show today brought to you by Squarespace. You've seen the uh, Super Bowl ad. I mean, that when I saw that, I said, hey, they made it to the big leagues. The Better Web Awaits television ad where they showed all the junk, the clutter the, in, in real life uh, that the web has become. Squarespace says you can have a better web experience, and everybody can if you use Squarespace. The all-in-one platform that makes it easy to create your own professional website, blog, portfolio squarespace sites are beautiful they're clean they're uncluttered and they're easy to create in fact if you want to try it just visit squarespace.com click the get started button you can use it for two weeks without uh, any cost you don't even need to give them a credit card or anything and get a sense of what squarespace uh, can do for you that's hosting that just never goes down plus the best content management system you've ever seen giving you the greatest website uh, ever. I actually really liked this ad. I don't know if it was one of the top ads in the Super Bowl, but I have to say it got it got your attention. It was every cliche, every dumb thing that you've ever seen on the internet uh, all all wrapped up into uh, into one big ad. Uh, create your great new website at squarespace.com. Use their importers to import to all of the from all of the uh, best blog APIs into your new site so you can see what it would look like. That includes comments and images and links. If you like it, here's all I ask. Try it. Go to squarespace.com, use our offer code TWIT2, and get 10% off your new site. 25 beautiful templates to start with. The new logo creator tool, great for a small business or an individual that wants a logo with limited resources. The, the customer help has just been redesigned, and it's the best ever, 24-7 Support live chat and email, help self-up articles, video workshops. E-commerce is available on all subscription plan levels, even the $8 a month level, uh, which is nice because if you have a nonprofit or you want to do a school fund drive, you could totally do that for $8 a month when you register for a year. Cash wedding registries. You get the free domain name with the one-year registration. You get to use the new Squarespace metric app for the iPhone and the iPad so you can check, check your site stats, the blog app. Let's you post. The code is gorgeous. The back end is beautiful. They know what they're doing, and their hosting is second to none. I want you to try it. Go to Squarespace. Two-week trial available without a credit card. You don't need to use our code, nothing. But if you decide to buy, get 10% off by using the offer code TWIT and the number 2. Squarespace.com. A better web awaits you at squarespace.com. So Bill Gates has done a Reddit AMA before. This one, uh, uh, I'm not sure what the what prompted it, except maybe that he is now going to be spending one third of his time uh, advising Satya Nadella. Do you know Satya Nadella, uh, uh, Gom? Have you talked to him? Have you interviewed him? I have actually on multiple occasions, and I think he's the right man for the job. You do. He's uh, he's definitely one of a new breed of uh, leaders. Uh, he listens. He cares for people, and he actually has very precise and 
concise ideas about technology, how it impacts Microsoft, and what Microsoft needs to do in the future. That's you know, awesome. There is, there is a very likely chance that um, he's going to surprise us in a good way uh, in next few He's in taken on what must be one of the toughest jobs, second only to running Yahoo, maybe, in the tech industry. Uh, I mean, Yahoo's not really a job, right? I mean, <laughs> what is it, an adventure? It's, it's, it's an arbitrage on <laughs> Alibaba stock, so it's not Actually, really... that's a boy, that's a really interesting way to put it. But the Alibaba, they own a, they own a, uh, how much of the Alibaba? Uh, they, they own enough that most of their stock valuation is <laughs> essentially a proxy for Alibaba Holy cow. Stock. Alibaba, the search engine in China. If it does well, Yahoo does well. Right. And I think my view on, on uh, Microsoft is that Microsoft actually has a lot of products. They're doing really well in some categories. They have suffered pretty extensively in the personal computing space. And I'm not sure how they come back from that decline, but they are going to do pretty well in the cloud space right that's the yeah. challenge isn't it because they dominated the 80s and the 90s by creating a software platform that everybody used 90 percent of all computers and then suddenly the rug is pulled out from under them they say apple they see the devices mobile takes over uh the new platform is clearly cloud but they've been beaten to the space by amazon by google by a lot of other companies um do, do you think cloud is where their future lies or is it in devices yeah. I think it's the cloud. I think cloud and cloud-based services is where they can actually start to have an impact. You think about it, for a company like Apple, they need, you know, cloud services, and they really severely lack in, in the cloud-based cloud services. They cloud -based service, right? cannot do it. Right, because it's just not part of their DNA. Whereas enterprise and building platforms for the enterprise is part of Microsoft DNA. There is a whole in a big wide world out there which needs uh, a cloud service and you know they're not all gonna go to amazon a majority will go to amazon but there is a whole bunch of microsoft based enterprises out there they need to find cloud and and microsoft has a huge opportunity there they've done a good job of building out a network and infrastructure and i think deep down they all know that they need to adapt to this new personal computing world where people don't pay for an operating system, people don't pay for for applications or productivity applications or browsers and stuff like that. What people pay for is either the hardware or the services. I think with Nokia, they have a shot at hardware. I mean, I still remain very iffy about that. But on the services, the cloud-based services, they actually have a good shot. I think, you know, Easy. They're late to the game. I mean, you've got Google is dominant, Amazon. In in cloud services? Yeah. But and Amazon is do dominant. Google is is great with making, you know, pronouncements. Doesn't everybody use Google Docs? No, but just it's not just Google Docs we're talking about, right? Like we're talking about the actual infrastructure of the cloud like which is where right. microsoft can provide a lot of upside right. i think they can't just think in terms of the number of people who want to still use outlook and exchange and oh that's just sad. hosting that on the cloud <laughs> is a big business i know it's sad but there is people who want to do that right? no a lot of bi business that's who wants it and uh now business hated Windows 8. Should Microsoft just abandon Windows? How important is Windows to this? It doesn't seem like it's at all important. The cloud doesn't require Windows. I mean, I use two two kinds of, you know, clients. I use iPad for pretty much everything and when I really need something other than like iPad, I end up either using my my MacBook Pro, which is what I'm using to communicate right now, or the Chromebook. I have a Chromebook and I use that occasionally to write and do email and stuff. Well, you're not helping Microsoft at all. No, I mean, like, why would I? Right? <laughs> I, mean, I, I I'm pretty uh, operating system agnostic at this right. point. I want... But you're the future. I think you're not alone. And I think Google's been smart seeding Chromebooks into uh, education. And, it's, and with a huge success in the last year, those kids are going to grow up never having touched a Microsoft program. I think the, the kids are growing up not knowing what it is to 
like, I, I, you look at the kids today, they are, uh, they are starting with the idea of a non-keyboard and a you know, touch-based interface. That's their introduction to computing. Right. I mean, forget who makes it. You know, it's Android, Chrome, you know, or, or, or Apple. And I think that's the challenge. I think Apple, Microsoft is still caught between the past and the future. I think it's a pretty hard place to be. I think you see the same challenges for for Intel. Like Intel too is struggling to find its own you know future in this. Oh, um, we're we're starting to lose you. I think Tony Bates is pissed off about your uh, review of Saudi and Nadella. Can you unplug and plug in the audio uh, interface to the okay. USB port? Sometimes that fixes it. It's making this chattering sound, which we we believe is a uh, buffer overflow in the software. I don't think so. No. Now it's even better. <laughs> Thanks for making it. <laughs> I fixed it. <laughs> uh, that, I mean, you're you're one of the few people I've heard who sounds uh, who's bullish on uh, Satya Nadella. I think a lot. I think a lot of it is we just don't know who Satya is, and he certainly comes from the uh, the, the the enterprise and the cloud group. I mean, if that's if that's uh, if you agree that that's the future for Microsoft, he's the right guy for the job. Hey, Om, could you unplug your computer if it's a laptop? You think it's... It's it's horrible. Something weird is going on. Bees have infested your microphone. Tell you what, while you're doing uh, that, Om, let's take a look at some of the things you may have missed this week on Twit. Previously on Twit. Security Now. A guy named Matt Vukas has, I think, very effectively demonstrated that Comcast is now throttling Netflix. Triangulation. Brett Martin, his most recent book, Difficult Men. David Chase said to me that he was never 100% sure whether The Sopranos was a drama or a comedy. Father knows best how to kill people. Know how. So you decided that for a Valentine's gift, we should build a... What is this, jewelry? You know, the best kind of gifts are the ones that you build yourself, too. Twit. We love you. Hi, my name is Leo. Hi, my name is Leo. Video. Hi. So, uh, I guess I, I guess what we were saying is that uh, because Satya Nadella came from enterprise, he came from uh, cloud. He's the right guy if you're going to lead Microsoft into that new world. What happens to Windows, though? Oh. Okay. Yeah, you're asking me. Oh. Yeah, what happens to Windows? Is it gone? Do you start? Do you do a Windows nine, or do you just give up? You know, it's sort of like what Apple is doing with its OS X, right? It just is on a path to being sunset. So, but some... this, but but Apple has iPad and iPhone. What does Microsoft have to replace? They need they need to figure that one out. Uh huh. Right? Yeah. <laughs> really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> like soon. <laughs> Actually, Nokia, I like Nokia's products. I think they have a great range of products. It's just that the Windows phone system is behind. doesn't have the apps. doesn't have the mind share. It's, a, it's actually a very good operating system, and the Nokia hardware is second to none. And nobody's buying it. And that's, that's probably a fair assessment. Bill Gates says he uh, uses a Surface 2 Pro. Doesn't have much choice. Um, he can still jump over a small chair. Remember, that was his secret uh, superpower when he was younger. He could jump over a chair from a standing start. And uh, finally, he does the dishes every night at home because he likes the way he does it. And I just love the image of the richest guy in the world doing his own dishes. Those are all from the Reddit AMA. Um, there's lots more to talk about, but gosh, we've gone on for hours and hours and I just, I think we're all tired now. So I'm going to, I'm going to let Serenity go back to House of Cards. I'm very excited to find out what terrible deaths oh my or God. deeds happen next. Can I, can I just say, I've only, I'm only a few episodes ahead of you and it actually, it gets worse. I believe, I mean, the first, <laughs> the first episode of the second series. Jaw dropping. Not away anything. Yeah. I'm like, uh, do to do. They're not gonna do that. Uh, oh, they oh. just did that. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and I very like disturbing. I, the, I'm just you know, surprised that, that all of you have so much time on you. I know what. Oh, um, I was sick for a weekend. Oh, I, I love. Like I, you can. It. I go home and I watch TV. That's all I do. <laughs>
I love it. Um, True Detective, also very good. We'll be watching that later tonight as well. Mm. Um, House of Cards, uh, the thing I like about the first episode, because because it's what's cool, uh, uh, What the thing that I like is a conceit that came from the British version of this, which is every once in a while he'll turn and address the camera and explain what's going on. Say, well, this guy, I'm going to get him. Uh, and he doesn't do it for most of the first episode. And you're thinking, what, did they get rid of that? And then he does. And they, they wait just long enough. Just it's long very enough. charming. <laughs> I don't know. Kevin Spacey talking directly Love at the him. camera. I can get behind that. Get behind that big time. We are working to get Kevin back on the show. We've interviewed him several times before to uh, talk about that. But he's kind of busy, you know, going to major networks, things like that. Um, so thank you, Serenity. We appreciate you being here. I hope you feel a little bit better. I know you you had a little cold. You sound fine. You sound great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully it all goes away okay. sooner or later. I've got a roller derby match later this week, so. Try oh, that's right. Feel better. <laughs> that's right. I forgot you were a roller derby queen. It's true. What's Just your What's your roller team. derby name? R two D to Nate. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, R two D to Nate. <laughs> You're welcome. Good luck on Glad the match. Glad to be on here as always. <laughs> oh, Malik, always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us and for holding the microphone for the entire two hours. You did well. Very good. Always good to see you. And thanks to John Graham coming. Anything you want to plug? Obviously, uh, the book is great. The Geek Atlas. The website uh, for the movie. Uh, the movie. What is it called again? Movie. Movie code. Moviecode.tumblr.net. Really awesome. Anything else? Well, if you have a website. Uh, think about signing up with Cloudflare. There's a free plan and you can get protection from attackers and it'll be faster and distributed around the world. I'll we actually have been that. getting DDoSed quite a bit, but not on our website, but IRC. And uh, I think people DDoS Skype because if they can guess your Skype name, they can, they can find your IP. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yes. I think we're getting a lot of that. I don't know if Cloudflare can help, but if it can, I'm calling you. Send me an email after yeah. this. Those script kitties, they're, so, they're just terrible. They got no, no sense of humor at all. Thank you all for being here. We do this show every Sunday afternoon, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 2200 UTC on twit.tv. If you can't watch live, please do. But if you can't watch live, uh, we've got on-demand audio and video uh, after the fact available at twit.tv and wherever finer netcasts are aggregated, like iTunes. Please subscribe. You'll get it every week. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Another twit this is in the can. amazing. Thank you there, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Doing the twit. All right. Doing the twit, baby. Doing the twit. All right. Doing the twit, baby.